We're up, we're going, are we live? <laughs> All right, going. now we're live. Now we're live, <laughs> we're online. Hey guys, good morning. Good morning everyone. Um, thanks for joining us as always. Glad to be back for another tip of the day live. Um, Mark's got some really good stuff for us today. Um, You've got some really good stuff for us today. Be sure to use the comment, the chat section. Let us know your questions. We have a couple questions that came in about some stuff that, that we kind of have um, prepared for you, but, but a lot of the stuff we're going to talk about is uh, stuff that you're going to give us. Yeah, particularly, of course, probing. That was you know, one, of the, one of the main topics for today. And so if you, we've talked about probing a lot, um, but if you happen to have some stuff that you're getting stuck on or questions that you have, definitely put those in the comments and we'll try to get to all of those. Frank, uh, Frank. Uh, Mark's got some stuff prepared, but we'd love to hear other comments so that we can kind of get in to deal with people's actual, you know, day-to-day -day problems with, with these things. You would think that we would run out of stuff to talk about, and it just doesn't, it just never stops. We get emails all the time, uh, and you can email, um, you can obviously email your, your Haas Factory Outlet Applications group. Uh, they're your first line of defense because they know your, your, your shop. And, uh, you know, so there's people like us all over the world uh, there prepared to help you. And then we'll also take stuff, um, questions about our videos and stuff at tod at haascnc.com, tod, tip of the day, tod at haascnc.com, we'll answer that. Or just comment on videos online and we'll um, most likely answer them. Maybe not in a timely fashion though. For, for the, the quick answers, talk to your dealers. Yeah, we'll typically try to answer the question on the YouTube comment or bring it up the next time on the next live TOD. Yeah. Um, so right before we get started, I have, I have a, I think a question that will get us launched off into talking about probing uh, right away here. But um, thanks everyone for joining us. We have people from uh, here in the States and then abroad as well. A bunch of people on here from India, it looks like. Thanks for, thanks for joining us. Uh, one of these comments uh, caught my attention. Bending Sands 87 says, the best time to have a live stream, the middle of my work day, so I can't ask any questions live. Bummer. If you can, it looks like you got a comment in there, so throw us a question in there, and we'll try to get to it <laughs> if, if you can. Um, glad you're joining us. Uh, so, uh, do, do the questions this, stay up after we repost the live? Do those questions, the live stream comments, do they disappear when we repost? Yeah, so there, there's actually another question here about, about whether we can, you can view the live stream after yeah. the live stream. And you can. You just go to the live tab uh, on, you, on our YouTube channel, and it will show you all the, the previous live streams. Um, sometimes we'll post, like last time, we had a little issue with our Wi-Fi over here, oh, and yeah. the stream went down and we brought it back up. In that case, we put that, we put those two pieces of the stream together and post Perfect. them as a regular so video. even if you can't stick around for the live stream, put in your question now, we'll answer it, and you can watch the answer later. Yeah, that's right. So, get going on, getting, moving over to probing. Um, so, this was a question that was on the Indicator Basics uh, video seem pretty popular. Um, John L says, "Hey, I'm having an issue. Could you guys tell me how the Haas Renault Show probe code works for a partial boss probe cycle to find the center of a boss that's not fully round?" That's and we a, had already been talking about this, and this th that is kind of crazy. Was, so, can you read that again? That's a okay. Having an issue. Uh, please tell me how the Haas Renault Show. Tell me the Haas Renault Show probe code for a partial boss probe cycle to find the center of the boss that's not fully round. And actually, eggs are to be crushed had answered G65 P9823. He's got a job. That's, that's the answer right there. So what that P9823... But you're going to talk about that a little yeah, more. We'll, we'll take a look at that. And I'll put something on the board here. So if you don't know what he's talking about, normally if you go to MDI or whatever, or the offset page or whatever, and I come up here, 
and I go to VPS, um, all these different probing options. Um, and so I can, I can probe a bore, I can probe a boss, all these cool things. But not every single cycle is on that page. There are some cycles um, that aren't there. And this is, this is the one that's there. And if you've got, um, this comes up m mostly uh, when we're dealing with parts that have already come off a, a, a broaching machine or what have you. So if I've got a, um, a part that's been broached for a keyway, our typical probing cycle, if we go into VPS or um, you know, VQC or whatever software you're running on your machine, typically will come in with a probe and the probe's gonna come in and it's gonna go, uh, it's gonna come over, it's gonna go beep, it's gonna come over here, it's gonna go beep, then it's gonna come down here, it's gonna go beep, and then you know what's coming next. It's gonna come here and it's gonna go beep. And so that keyway is gonna totally goof up our probe center line. Um, and we're gonna get the wrong diameter. And um, how do we avoid this? Well, the, the, the quickest way to avoid that is just to, if I come back here, if you have that same exact situation with a, a brooch, what we'd really wanna do is say, can we, can we come in from this angle right here? and then this angle right here, and then this angle right here, and probe on three points. So we've got a three-point probing cycle. And we can do that, but it takes, it takes some doing. It's not in one of our um, um, standard probing cycles, and there are good reasons why it's not. And we'll mention those right now. Let's kind of go through the process. But if you ever need to use this type of probing cycle, it's, it's pretty straightforward. It's pretty cool, but you have to follow the right steps. And like always, a lot of these steps are in the, the Haas um, Renishaw Inspection Plus manual. And so if you just type um, on the internet, go to Haas video bonus content, and you do a search for that, you're gonna find um, links to all the bonus content to our video, and you'll find every one of our probing videos has a link to the Inspection Plus manual uh, that covers this, the, uh, this P9823 cycle that we're talking about. Um, and there's a few cycles like this, and it's called, it's, it, I don't know what it's called in there, we'll look it up, but it's a vector probing cycle. Um, vector, uh, vector just means, it's, it's not just a direction, it's a, it's a direction, what does vector mean? It's like physics class. Vector is, um, yeah, it's, it, it's a direction and a speed mm -hmm. combined by that, but, so normally we're probing only along the X and Y axis, and this one has to probe along these axes. So the way that this code would be is you would you'd call up your, your program. Uh, right, I've got, the, I've got the code right here. We'll start our probe, turn the probe on, all that kind of normal stuff, and I'll give you this code as well. We'll bring it up on the screen. But in this particular case, um, on our probing cycle, we're gonna call up all of our safe startup line, turn the probe on, 9832. We're gonna do a, um, uh, that's a probe on. We're gonna do a safe positioning move, moving into our position. Um, safe move, but this is where the good stuff starts. Uh, P G65, P9823. And we're gonna, on this same line, put an A, B, C position. Now A is gonna be our, our first hit point. It's gonna, in this case, let's say we want A 30 degrees and I'm gonna even these out. I'm gonna come over here. This is gonna be B, 120 degrees, 150 degrees. And then 120 plus that would be C, 270. Now, uh, Frank, let's go ahead and pull this up right here. We can, we can come over to my computer and I'm gonna show you the Renishaw Inspection Plus manual. And again, you can go to the Haas website, look for Inspection Plus. Um, but we'll show you what's going on here in the code. So if you could, if you could put this line, we're up. So on the screen right now in front of you, we've got the Inspection Plus manual, this three point bore or boss measurement. And uh, it's real similar to what we'd like to do. And if we sc scroll down to the bottom, it'll have an example code for us, which is fantastic, right here. And so the three points are A, B, and C, and it's gonna come in A, B, and C, and in this case, Oh, that's funny. That's the exact same thing I just did. Huh, so our example is theirs. I didn't look at this, it's, that's funny. Uh, my diameter is gonna be 1.6 inches. But yeah, A30, B150, and they wrote C minus 90. I wrote C270, it's the same position. 
uh, those, those three points. And so it's gonna hit those three points and run. Now, uh, we can go back live. But if you were to just, if you were to just uh, run this program that we can give the example of, if you were to run that program, you're gonna get an alarm immediately right now. It's gonna get this uh, 1106 probe not calibrated alarm because these cycles, um, vector cycles, require vector calibration. You have to recalibrate your probe in order to use them. So even if you find the Renishaw Inspection Plus manual and you use this, this cycle right here, uh, you're gonna have to recalibrate your probe if you're gonna ever do three-point probing. And so, uh, it, you know what, we're gonna stick it's around. It's just because it doesn't, know, it doesn't know where it should be in that direction, right? Yeah. Basically, yes. it's going like the, you. You've calibrated to go this direction and this direction, but not. Yes. This, so it doesn't know where the That's hysteresis exactly. is and in those directions. After something. this video, after we get done shooting this, Frank and I will stick around. We'll shoot a little bit longer video that goes over three-point uh, probing, and we'll go through the step by steps. But in general, if you try and you, the only way to three-point probe is to use a direct. 9823 Renishaw cycles, so you can download that manual. Not only that, but you have to recalibrate your probe. So you're gonna wanna use, you're gonna wanna get the Renishaw Inspection Plus manual, you're gonna use a P9823, you're gonna follow the instructions, and then you're gonna have to um, recalibrate your probe using a, a 9804 to calibrate it. And Frank, let's show that right now. So if you guys are off the machine right now, I'm gonna switch programs. Um, and, and I'm running a program right now uh, on my screen, and, and literally all it says in the control is it's calling up my tool, it's calling up my tool offset, uh, H25 in this case, and then I'm starting the probe, and then I'm running a G65 P9804, uh, 1.5 inches, and then a G65 9833. This entire calibration probing process is, is three lines long, and we'll make a whole video on that. I'm just gonna run this cycle right now, and tell me what you see. So it's taking one point, two points, three, four, and normally that's done. With a normal calibration process, that's all we see. But it's going, it's continuing to hit at multiple spots along the outside edge. So it's calibrating, 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 and we'll look at that. Our normal calibration is only hitting one, two, three, four points. And this guy is hitting those one, two, three, four points and then it's hitting this left one and the right one again, and then it's also hitting it here and 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 here. It's doing a vector calibration, so it knows how far, you know, out of spec our, our probe tip is from each and every direction to give us a more accurate reading uh, with, our, with, our, with our probes. So this calibration point, the, the cycle that I just ran to calibrate this probe, is, is a 14 point instead of a four point calibration process. And again, we use the P9804 to do that. We're gonna make a whole other video on that. So to three point probe, you have to have a very specific program written and you have to rerun the calibration on this. If you don't run the vector calibration process, you're gonna get an alarm and um, you won't be able to use it. So the reason that we've done this is that frankly, in most cases, uh, the regular four point probing operation is much more is much more um, accurate than the three point because people will goof up. And when you're talking about partial, the, like the question, a partial right. partial bore or por partial boss, right. if, I, if I'm using a three point process for probing, I wanna keep my, my three points spread out as evenly as possible. 120 degrees apart is perfect. And then put your notch in between there somewhere. If you chose, if you chose three points to probe, that were right next to each other, you're not, you don't have enough of an arc segment to get a really accurate view of the entire. So any errors that you have in your probing are gonna be amplified and it's not gonna be very accurate. This is not a good way to probe. Sometimes we have to, but you're, you might be off by thousands of an inch where typically if you're probing something evenly with a three point or with a four point, you've got this thing probed within a tenth of a thou. So we do this only when we have to, in fact, um, I put a picture on my computer here. We can go back to my computer for a second. Um, this, is, this was texted me by a friend, uh, Jonathan Sessa, and they were making these parts and they had to probe them for a second operation. 
and he was probing this part and you can see that he that this would be a really hard part to probe because it's got keyways in very odd spots and they're adding some more you know geometry on the far side so how do you probe this guy and so we talked through it and he had already figured it out and we were just talking about it uh he he had a quick question about um uh about the the syntax of it before he ran it but he had it going so i think he was just uh, showing off for the most part he's, he's a pretty smart guy but it's a beautiful part and this is exactly the type of application that we would use to uh with with three point um probing so we've got that um we can go back to the the ring gauge right now and we'll talk about this more if there's a if there's a if there's a z on your uh, on your code line, it's going to be for a boss. If there's not a Z on there, it's going to assume that it's a bore and it's going to all work out pretty good. So um, it's just a fantastic way to do it and it's come up a lot. We had we had somebody in our own machine shop do it. I've got an email about it recently. I got that text about got it. And a bunch of emails, I think. Yeah, so I don't yeah, know how so many we, people... we know that there's definitely questions at least four. out there for probing. <laughs> so we'll make a video this afternoon about this uh, for the four people that are, that, are, that are dealing with this. Yeah, we were talking about what, what's the ratio between how many people need to know something versus how many people ask about it. You know, is it 1,000 to 1? Is it 10,000 to 1? Is it 100 to 1? I don't oh, know. Yeah. Probably different for different topics, but... We've got no idea, right? So we answer the phone, and we've gotten this, this phone call a few times, uh, but we don't know. So, but we figure if somebody's asking this question, there's there's a hundred people that are that are struggling through it mm -hmm. so we're making a video to help to help our customers not struggle that's the whole point of these videos is we don't want you to struggle at all we want you out there making money and we're gonna do everything we can to to make life easier for you uh manufacturing engineer uh you know at haas automation assembly you know he's been there he's he struggled with this for years <laughs> uh, on the shop floor i've ran job shops and and i've i've run high volume production and so I've, I've stayed up till two o'clock in the morning deburring parts to get them out by Monday. We've been there and we have a lot of empathy for you. It's, and, it's like you were saying, you're gonna talk about other things that can yeah. shut down your probing real quick. And as you were saying, as we all know, why, you know having, a, having a battery that goes dead in your probe can shut you down for half a day if you don't know to look for that. Oh, that's the worst. And it's the just worst. the most exasperating thing in the world. So keep asking your questions, but I'm going to blab here for a yeah, second. Yeah, we haven't so even we haven't answered. There's a bunch Andrew of them in here. Andrew, look through that. So yesterday, uh, yesterday afternoon, I came in and I knew that we were going to be doing something on probing today. So I uh, I came back over here and I uh, turned on the probe and I started checking things out, make sure the probe worked. And right off the bat, I went to go and uh, the thing alarmed out on me and I was getting all these alarms and it wouldn't work. And I knew exactly where to look first. Anytime you're getting an alarm while, while probing, uh, depending on the alarm. Uh, most often, it's going to be your battery, right? These, these, these uh, lithium thionyl chloride or whatever, these LTC batteries um, are very strange. So I, I changed the batteries on my probe and everything was working again and I was, I was up and going. But the voltmeter here is, is because these probe batteries are psychotic. Um, they lie uh, all the time, pathological liars. You can check these batteries and it might say that it's 3.6 volts, and it might be, but it's not. Uh, the way that the life span is on these, on these LTC batteries is they can sit on the shelf for 10 years and they don't go bad like a normal alkaline battery is. And they'll hold 3.6 volts and they'll work fantastic for as long as they're going to until they stop working immediately. But you let them sit for a few minutes, you check the voltage again, and they might still read 3.6. So it's hard to tell when these batteries are good and when they're bad. And so um, one thing that you'll definitely want to do is whenever you do put in new batteries, uh, we talk about this in a lay in a Yeah, you go into, the, into some detail about batteries in, your pro, in one of your probing videos. <laughs> pro, with probing problems, it's, you know, the code, and then it's just make sure the batteries are going. Whenever I change batteries on a probe, I always, always pull out my Sharpie, which I keep in my pocket always, and I write the date on there. You know, so the ones I put in yesterday, I wrote 721. Is it, are we still July? Yeah. Six, seven. I wrote 721. So I wrote 721 on them. So when they go out or when I'm having problems, I can pop it open and say, no, these were just changed. It's not the battery, even though it reads 3.6 volts. And in general, um, this, this probe right here has batteries in it. And it's, the probes, as far as I know, this thing's on right now. It's kind of in a sleep mode 
right now. There's no lights on, but when it gets a signal from the, from the OTS on the back wall, it really comes to life and it starts pulling more energy. But just right now, sitting here, it's, it's using a little bit of electricity, just keeping these you know, receptors alive. And so it's going to, um, it's going to drain the battery just sitting here. Uh, so generally speaking, for a, a spindle probe like this, you might get eight months worth of, of battery life on it, maybe, maybe, maybe six if you're using it all the time. So between six and eight months is kind of a, a normal expectation. And so people say, no, the batteries aren't dead, I just changed them. And then they look, and if they wrote the date on it, they realize, oh, I changed those a year ago. And the date gives you a, a handy way to kind of monitor what you can expect and how yeah. soon you should be changing it. You can't it. trust your voltmeter. And uh, what's funny is I actually measured these two that I pulled out yesterday. And it's, it, this does happen this way sometimes. One of these batteries reads 3.2 volts, the other one read zero volt. So sometimes you do get voltage on them. But the problem is if I let these sit, uh, you know, for any amount of time, they might go back up to 3.6 and, and they'd be lying to me. So we'll get about 250 days of use out of a spindle probe and a little bit longer on the, the tool setting probe that's mounted to your table. Uh, those might run 310 days, um, generally speaking, lifespan. And so, uh, yeah, batteries, we, batteries, batteries. Shall we jump over to, a, yeah. a, there's a bunch of questions. So let's start off with Kieran Hovarth asks, in your WIPS videos you showed to, to use the part probe to calibrate your tool probe. Shouldn't a reference tool be, should, it, should a reference tool not be used? Uh, yeah, there's different ways to calibrate the thing. I absolutely always use a reference tool. And you would think that we're going to there. Uh, I could walk over to my toolbox. So, so I'm going to walk over. I'm going to grab something we're really fast. We're not going to track him as he's walking. You're not going <laughs> to track me as I'm walking? We have uh, only hard mounted cameras today here. <laughs> no, uh, no gimbaled cameras. Um, so, whoops broke the latch. So what I've got here is, um, this is just my own stuff. So this big giant box here uh, is something yeah. that ships with our UMC machines and you can buy these from, from Haas as well. And they're well oiled. Put that guy there, put this guy here. We sell kits to calibrate your machine tools. And so this is a ball gauge that we can calibrate off of for our five axis machines. Um, and by the way, these bags are amazing. They're, they're V, you guys comment it in the thing, v, VSC bags, vitriolic, something or other. These bags keep stuff from rusting. So they actually absorb Without the- Without rust preventative on the- No rust preventative. Um, wow, I need to put everything in my garage should be inside one of those bags. They should. These <laughs> bags create a vapor, um, like a little, they create a vapor inside the bag that just doesn't allow for rust. And so we put all these type of things in these type of bags. They have oil on it, but um, yeah, these vapor bags are terrific. So, so this is my, my regular tool that I'll use to calibrate my, um, my tool setter on the machine. I always use that. We've got some videos. Look for, look for uh, probe calibration, and you'll find videos that talk all about that. And you don't have to use a fancy tool like this. You can use just a, uh, a dowel pin of a known diameter a half inch dowel pin that you can use a set of micrometers on and use that to, to uh, set your tool presetter, or I mean your, yeah, your, your table probe. But I usually want something uh, better than that. I want, I want one of these because these things have a known length for the tool, you know, about five inches from the tip to my gauge line. And on this Cat 40 tool, gauge line is where everything's based on. It's where the, it's where that, 724 taper meets 1.75 inches diameter. So the distance from that, that's my gauge line, which is close to the face of the spindle, to the tip. And we write that number right on the tool. Um, I actually travel a bit. And so I like my, my Mari tool uh, thing. This is the exact same thing as our Haas ones. These are meant for the shop. The reason I love this one is because I do travel so much. Um, this is the same thing. This is a tool of an absolute known length and diameter. And so um, I'll travel, and I like this because it weighs less than my toolbox, and I can only carry 50 pounds. And so uh, I'll use that all the time. So you probably we, run into that weight limit real quick. Yeah. <laughs> I, With tools. I, the dowel pin measure is fine because the entire probing system is internally consistent. So if you stick a dowel pin in there and just take a, uh, a scale, and measure the dowel pin to about the spindle face. 
And if you use that as your number, it's totally fine. Uh, dowel pin diameter, you mic it, you know what that is, 0.5 inches. So you use that to calibrate. Watch the, watch the calibration videos. We've got them, you can just use a scale to measure the length. And because it's all internally consistent, if your length isn't perfect, it's not gonna matter that much. Um, but if you are using an offline tool presetter, if you're using an offline tool presetter, that's a different thing altogether. If I'm using an offline tool presetter, I want those numbers for my tool lengths that it prints out on the little sticky thing. When it says my tool is five inches long, I wanna be able to take that same tool for my presetter, put it in here in my machine, uh, especially on horizontals. And if I do use the probe inside the machine to probe the tool length, I want to get the exact same number that I got on my tool presetter, which means I'm not gonna use the dowel pin method to set my, my tool probe in my machine. I'm gonna use a, a true you know, um, you know, test bar tool type setter here, a tool of a, of a known length and diameter. I'm gonna use that same tool to, to set my, my tool probe on my machine as well as the, the tool presetter because I want this closed circuit. I want a system that um, gives me the same number no matter how I probe it. So I'll use that to, to set my, my tools. Uh, again, just Google Haas probe calibration. You'll find a video on it. And beyond that, uh, I'll, sh I'll show you what I'm using. So I've got this guy too. This is, um, this is, this is, this is a little bit ridiculous. Uh, this is basically the, like the same price as a weekend in Vegas, but it's, <laughs> it's, I love this thing. Um, if, but I'm calibrating probes way more than anyone That's should. That's the fanciest calibration ring I've ever seen. I it think. is, it's all but, ground. Are those built into it? The yes, magnets? so it's got, mag, it's got magnets in the bottom that hold it down. And it's also got three you know, small pads, so it's got a really small contact location on it. And this particular tool is made by Productivity, so it's PQI, um, Probing Solutions. And these things are not cheap at all, but uh, the diameter in this thing's gauged out to like a millionth of an inch, right? At 50 millionths. No, way more than that. So this is, this is 1.49996 inches diameter. <laughs> And so for me, when I'm verifying my calibration processes for the way the machine works, I, I just want something perfect. Um, it's you know, way more than you'd ever need and it's magnetic, so it goes clunk on the table and I can use that to, to calibrate. So I use different methods. In a normal process, you could just use, if you wanted to, you could use, um, you, could, you could bore a hole, boring bar in a piece of material take a bore gauge, measure that diameter, and you could calibrate your probe off that if you wanted to. So there's lots of different ways. We have different methods of doing it. And we've got different videos on that. But um, because of the position that I'm in and the accuracy that I want, I'm using the real stuff. I'm using the real Haas tools, or I'm using a gauge ball, and I can take a set of micrometers and measure that gauge ball um, and, and use that to calibrate my tool. Our five axis machines will need to be calibrated with a gauge ball. And so a lot of our machines, um, we just we wrap all that probing stuff in with the machine. If you buy a UMC, I think, uh, I'm the button pusher, not the salesman, but I think that you get, we only sell the UMC with, with the probe. So you can kind of get this stuff as a kit when you buy those machines um, because it just makes machining so much easier when you can find the center line of your rotaries and that kind of stuff with the probing equipment. So all kinds of fun different tools. All right, so let's, uh, we have another question here uh, from Firework17. How do you set a new, work, a new work offset using the probe to set a work offset that's on an angle? Can uh, we do that from, from within VPS or do we need to go to the- Like an angle, I wonder like, um, I wonder what he means. It, it could be an angle. It's very, it's, it's, it's very, it's very different. So what I'll do is I'll say this, I'm gonna to go to, uh, I'm gonna to go to YouTube. And if we go back to my computer screen here. So if I go to Haas probing, not Haas probing, if I go to YouTube and I type in Haas probing and I do a search, then um, this video right here at the top, it shows you in process measurement. This shows you how to program by hand using the, the Renaissance Inspection Plus manual. Uh, this one here, set work offsets in seconds. That goes through the, the all the, all the, the probing programs that we've got in the machine. This one tells us how to, uh, how to use macros to adjust your tools. This is that calibration video I was talking about. My friend John made this. Um, this one right here, troubleshoot your probe. This video is telling us, check your batteries, check your batteries, check your batteries. And this video, this little piggy went to market. This video here, quickly pick up a work offset and an angle with your Haas probe. This is the video that you're gonna wanna watch um, which will come and explain, look how young I was. 
uh, let's see here, it'll come in and explain exactly how that, um, how you can probe a part that's at an angle, and then you can also use a G68 rotation to, uh, to um, straighten things out. So we won't go into depth on this right now, just know that you can go and, and, and check out this video, and uh, we can look at that. And it'll tell you how to probe this. We've got one video on this. Again, quickly pick up a work offset and an angle. And there's also another video that's fun. Uh, that's a Haas G68 right here. You can see this icon. And this block was, um, this vise was in there at a very weird angle and the holes were already drilled. And then we came in, probed that part that was at a weird angle. And then we followed it up with a tap. And so if this thing was not perfectly, if the machine didn't know exactly what angle that part was at, that tap would have broken. Uh, because again, the, the, the tool was already ran. Let's see here, I'm gonna flip through, there it goes. So it's, it's running there, and then we're following this. And this, this vise is all wonky in the machine. It's at a very funny angle. And so we're coming in, and we're chasing that angle. Then we're coming in and tapping. And this part was way off center. And we did all that with the probing cycles that we just talked about. So um, we've got options for you uh, with the G68 video, and then also this quickly pick up a work offset and an angle video. So, so that's it, that's one option. We've got you covered. And again, if you have a question like this, like three-point probing that we just barely touched on today, um, just know that it can be done. And then we're gonna make another video that, that, that hits it more specifically with some better up-close video shots. And so look for that video in the yeah, next couple weeks. Yeah, and please add the comment because as you, we're gonna, we'll end up you know, fielding half these. There's a lot of questions in here. We'll end up probably fielding half of these um, and, and then often you have, it's, often it's complex and you have to, to really get into the, to the weeds of it, you're gonna have a, a more involved yes. and, explanation. And we so. have like Frank Zaragoza behind us and stuff. I'll explain something poorly in an hour and then, and then that poor fellow, he will, he will edit it down into what looks <laughs> like, you know, six minutes of cogent explanation. And so we've got a big advantage with video, not live, but with the edited versions that we can shorten things down getting rid of everything that's superfluous until there's nothing left except for what you need to know. And that's how we want to make videos, um, to, to not waste your time. Um, and so we will cover again, three point probing again. Uh, just know you can't do it without vector calibration. And we'll talk more about that in that, that video. Okay, so here's another one that we've certainly touched on before, uh, but probably w worth reiterating. Eric Evans asks, can you use the probe to automatically inspect a feature, comp the tool and recut the feature? And can you set up to inspect every nth cycle? Oh my gosh. Okay, so, so are we, uh, you can come back live to the camera. So, so there's a, yes, you can. There's the two questions there. Can I have it probe something, and then say it's not within a certain range? Can I go back in and rerun that part? That's a lot of macro logic. And we've made a video on that. So I'll show you that video here on my computer screen in a second. The second question there is, can you have it check only the nth part? That, uh, let me- Want me to write something down, Mark? I'm gonna write this down. I got a piece of paper here. Uh, so I'm just gonna write down nth part. We'll make a video on this. It'll be a macro video. And that's a very difficult thing. So uh, I actually have a clever trick for doing that that I've used for, le for years. So it's, um, it's, a, it's a macro logic um, based on mod. So if I say, um, if I say uh, 12 mod five, what's the answer? The answer is two. What it basically is, it's the remainder of how, much, how many times this goes into that. It's, it's, it's silly, it's a weird thing, but using the remainder, I can then check and say, okay, whatever that value is, if it equals zero, then probe. If it doesn't equal zero, then don't probe. So I choose a number that's not evenly divisible by the number I wanna go into. I use the mod like, like, 12, like 12 mod, you know, 12 mod five. And, and then you check the remainder and if the remainder equals what you think it should equal, then probe. And you can use that kind of logic to probe every fourth part or every 16th part or every whatever. You can find a set of numbers that match to allow you to probe. And it's, it's mind blowing, it's weird, but it's the way that we get around that type of um, probing only every so often type of sequence. So uh, I wrote that down nth part. We'll make a macro video on that. But the other video, we can go back to my computer screen. This was a fun video. Again, go to, go to YouTube and Haas probing. And we made a video on automating your probe. Uh, right here, you can see the little icon here. It's got uh, this special part that we 
we designed this part for one purpose, just to be able to use for probing. <laughs> and uh, so I'm gonna come over here, we'll look at this. And so all this code right here is just telling us, in fact, I'm gonna go back to that code. It's just gonna come in here and it's gonna probe a bore and then it's gonna say, hey, if my bore is bigger than, you know, this, whatever I have in value of pound 100, then rerun it. And there's a whole bunch of other mac macro programs there. So I'm gonna flip through here. We explain what macro variables are. Sorry, that's the most ugly thing you've ever seen. <laughs> Buffering. And we made another video, probing one, two, three, four, five, that shows um, kind of the basics of probing. And then we show you how to use these macro variables. So, so again, everything that you need to do to have the machine probe a, uh, a feature and then um, go back and recut it, in fact, we've got a video right here. Right, even right now, like on the screen right now, you'll see that I've got highlighted, it says pound 188 bore diameter. Uh, and we, we can go back to live to the main camera. Um, I always do this. There's a, there's a video that's called, um, there's a video that's timers and macros. And so if you go to the current command. That's an old one. It's, yeah, <laughs> so you can, you can Google macros, uh, timers and counters, and there's a macro label and in the Renishaw Inspection Plus manual, go to Haas Video Bonus Content, Google that, you'll find a bunch of files and stuff um, that, you can, that you can download. Inside that file, you'll, you'll see the Inspection Plus manual. And uh, on page 4-2 of that, well, heck, we've got a computer hooked up. Why don't I show it to you? We'll go back to the computer right now, and I'm pulling up this article. And if you go to page 4-2, so uh, chapter four, variable, and I go down to two. Can you tell we've, we've answered this question before? Uh, here's a chart, variable chart. And over here, single surface wed, bore boss. So right here, underneath bore boss, the size of the probed bore is stored under macro variable pound 188, or on an NGC machine variable 10,188. Our X positions in variable 185, our Y is in, um, variable 186 so so this inspection plus manual is and you can come back live um is the roadmap for us and so if if i wanted to in that other video um probe a bore i probe a bore using one of the cycles from the renishaw manual or from vps and i just copy and paste it into a program then after i probe the bore it's going to tell me that diameter is 1.5 inches and if it was supposed to be 1.55 you can do some macro logic to have it you know do it and it's it, it's kind of it's just some heavy macros but uh, once you see it, it's, it gets easier and easier. And we made a whole video on that and you can check it out. But again, um, page 4-2 in the, in the Inspection Plus manual shows us those variables. And we made a video on the timers and counters page as well as I was looking at, if I run a probing cycle here and I put in macro label 188, then I can, then I can go to um, macro assign 188, macro label, bore diameter. And then when I probe something on the main screen in memory, here in the bottom right hand side, it's gonna say you know, bore diameter or, or whatever, or 188, whatever I put in there. And it'll actually show me whatever the probe value was right there on the main screen. So look for that video as well, um, the uh, macro timers and labels. It's a good so, question. So Excellent speaking question. of macros, um, Nick Nikolov asks, uh, or says, my new VF2 SS machine is optional with probing. Do I need to buy the macro option as well to do some of the in-process inspections, inspection cycles or macro logic mid-program? And that's an expensive well, option. Well, but you do, you do get macros. I, oh, oh, sorry. Oh, the punchline. Yeah. Macros cost thousands of dollars. Because we've got software engineers who do nothing but sit around all day making sure the macro option works and that the look ahead works and stuff like that. And we don't want everyone paying for it. We just want the people that, are, that need it paying for it which allows entry-level machines for guys who don't need macros to pay less for the machine. Uh, it's a unique system of sales, and I'm completely on board with that. Um, I think that the people that should be paying for macros are the people that use it. With that said, I think that the probing option on, um, on Haas machines is the best deal out there. Uh, just an incredible deal, because if you buy the probe for whatever it's selling for, is it six grand? I don't six know how much grand, it is. I think. But if you buy the probing option, your machine will automatically be bundled with the macro option. Spin so, orientation and yeah. Oh yeah, that's right. So it's yeah, gonna come with, with G68. It's got the um, rotation scaling, rotation. G50 scaling. So you're gonna get rotation scaling for free. Not for free, you paid for it. But <laughs> you paid for it as a combo. So we it. heavily discount those. If you were to buy all those options, rotation and scaling separately, you'll add in macros, add in your M19 spindle orientation, those will all add up to probably the same price as the probe. You get the probe 
option, you get all that other stuff necessary because the probe needs all that stuff to work. And so we package it all together. So I think the probe is already, it's certainly one of the, one of the better prices in the marketplace. Yes, uh, and I put, I used oily rag on my, <laughs> and uh, let's see, I'm gonna wipe this off with my hand, the terrible thing. So my rag has got oil on it. I don't wanna use it on my whiteboard, but the, when I think about um, probing in general, this to me is the way machining works. If you're, not, if you're not automating in some way, then your competitor down the street will automate and he's gonna crush you in the marketplace. Uh, you just won't be able to compete. And the way that we compete in today's modern world is through automation. And I was talking about, about this with uh, Frank yesterday uh, and it was, it was kind of cool, but when you're machining, you're gonna be, you're gonna be doing setups, right? Uh, you're gonna be doing setups. You have to set up the machine. And then we've got to, we gotta program the machine. Uh, then after the thing's set up and program, I guess you could switch the order of that. Maybe program it first and then set it up. But then you're gonna uh, run the parts. So you gotta load the parts. You gotta load and unload the parts. And then at the end of the day, you've gotta inspect those parts. And there's a bunch of other stuff I'm missing here. But whatever we can do to automate any of these setups um, is, is, gonna, is gonna be, uh, we're gonna be more productive uh, per man hour. We're gonna have a higher output. So automation, as in Haas automation. So we can automate the, the setup process. If you wanna automate your setup process, you're gonna buy the probe. That is how we get from manual to automation. That's how we're gonna save money. That's, this is how we automate our setup, is with the probe. And not only that, but we can actually use the probe for inspection as well. There's some caveats with that, because normally you want an offline machine to inspect it. Um, for programming, we've got VPS, for, especially on the lathe. The lathe VPS is really good. You can make a lot of different lathe parts on that. The million I like for simple stuff, simple pockets, but it's really good for drilling and tapping and that kind of stuff. So for programming, you can automate this. You're gonna buy VPS, and then you're also gonna heavily rely on a cam system for anything that's, that's complex. So if you wanna be competitive in the marketplace, if you wanna automate this process, you're gonna buy the, the conversational programming on a machine or a cam system. If you're gonna load and unload the parts, if you wanna automate that process, if you look at our website, you can look for automation stuff and it's exploded in the last few years. We're Haas Automation. We got our start, right, 1983, Gene Haas added the servo motors to the, the, the indexer, indexer, the 5C indexer, and he automated that manual processing, that process, and it seems like nothing but it was huge. And then uh, you know, that was in 83 and in 88, he built the first, uh, very first uh, mills and it just went from there. But beyond that, we sell, um, we sell APLs, automatic you know, pallet loaders, we pallet changing machines, and we've automated the robot integration. So we've made a bunch of videos on this, you can Google it. But you can just walk up to your Haas machine right now, type in some numbers here, which will jog around a robot arm mounted in front of your machine. It can automatically load your part. So, so, if you want to automate that, you're going to be looking at getting a, uh, an APL or a, uh, we've got lots Pallet of different changer, versions. Pallet changer, robot. Pallet yeah. changer, robot, whatever. And, and not only does a, the robot automate the, uh, the loading of the parts, but by getting the, the robot from us, uh, and again, I'm not a salesman, but, but it's like ShamWow. If I want a Shammy, that ShamWow is pretty freaking awesome. I, I don't mind being a salesperson for stuff that's, that's good. It's, it's gonna save us time and money. So I'm pretty easy to use. You can buy a robot, but we've automated not only the loading and unloading of parts, but we've automated the programming of the robots if you get the, the robot from us, because um, we've got the robot package with the machine, which means you can program it right from the control. Um, or the APL. And then inspection, uh, you can use a probe for running a part, inspecting it, and rerunning it, which is automating the in-process inspection. And then of course, in, um, in general, that's in-process inspection is the probe on the machine. But in general, if you want to automate the inspection process, you're gonna buy a CMM to offload your, um, your programming on the machine. Um, to save time there. So you guys have seen all these before, but, but uh, your probe, your, your VPS, conversational programming, your cam system, uh, you know, auto loads, robots on your machine, the probe to CMM, all this stuff right there separates 
1980 from 2021. <laughs> if, you, if you can do all this stuff, you can, I can program by hand, I can G code, I can set up by hand, I can load unload by hand, I can inspect by hand. That's, that's, very, that's very 1990. And if you're running you know, um, one part, that used to be the way we used to do it. But with the advent of this, and you, you couldn't automate with a robot, high volume production, because it just took so much, so much effort to do it. So in 1998, only the big guys had robots because it was so hard to get them installed and inspected and everything. But that's different. Now, this type of stuff is available for the one-man shop, which is even better. If you're a one-man shop, if you've got two Haas machines, and you can walk you away from it. You need every, every set of hands you yeah. can, even if uh, yeah. they're maybe not even. And we hands. automated the, the programming of it so you can walk away. So anyhow, I, I gave a talk on, uh, to HTEC. Yeah, yeah, you went far enough down this road that I think we have to segue, because I was going to ask you about. The reason I'm talking yeah, about this so is. Mark did, a, did a, the, keynote, the keynote presentation on Monday for the HTEC conference. Um, online and we were talking about we were going to talk a little bit about what you talked about and then we got into this discussion about and somehow we we got talking about the what we all have in our garage that like the big box of cables oh. the RCA cables and we the, couldn't find a cable for the, the camera this cat five ca or the old uh, the old uh, cable cables um, and how you if you you know I pull that box down off the shelf and I realize that every time I pull it down more and more of it is not present day technology and pretty soon I just got to throw it out and and we began talking about if you, know, you have to train for the right stuff because otherwise you're training for stuff that's not relevant anymore if you don't have this stuff and your competitor down the street does if you haven't upgraded to this type of automated equipment uh, your competitor is doing things at a factor just multiple times. So in the, I was, I love the industrial revolution. I've, you know, I kind of map it and I sit there. I've got, my entire bookshelves are full of this stuff. But in, when they used to, to, to make the thread for, for cotton and this type of stuff, um, the, they used to take a, a, a spinster, uh, a gal in front of a spinning wheel, and she would, you know, turn these small little bits of cotton fiber into long strings that could be used for weavers. Now, it used to take three spinsters to create enough uh, yarn to keep a, a weaver busy. But in 1720s, they created the first machines for that, you know, Thomas and his brother John Loam. And then they came out in like 1768, the father of the Industrial Revolution, uh, Richard uh, Arkwright, who became Sir Rich Richard Arkwright. And uh, because he was granted a, a you know a night shift there kind of, and so that's what started the industrial revolution, which which the spinning jenny increased the productivity of that that process six times from what it used to take manually. That machine that that Arkwright built to do the same process increased the productivity by six hundred fold. Can you imagine being down the street from those guys? And Thomas Thomas Lohman, his brother, who had opened up a mill in 1720. Everyone was saying, how you doing, Thomas? You know what he told us? He's like, I can barely keep the doors open. This is such an inefficient process. It's barely working like that. He was lying through his teeth. He was making parts, you know, making that yarn faster than anyone and telling people that it was taking him a long time mm -hmm. when it wasn't because he didn't want else, anyone else to know about his processes and how he was crushing it. But when his shop went from, from eight people to, to 300 people, it's a little obvious <laughs> that you've got work coming in the door. And so... Um, yeah, if you want if you want to be making stuff faster, more efficiently, uh, you know, less man hours per output, uh, you're going to have to automate. But it's a it's a fantastic topic, and and we're still right in the middle of the industrial revolution, and we're kind of in this spot right here, uh, still. In fact, the probing stuff, um, I have to look up the the name. It should have been in my thing. So in 1973, uh, McMurdy, who's who's the the inventor of the the, the Renishaw probe. Um, he was probing some parts for the Concorde jet. And so I think he's Sir McMurdy. I think that he got a night shift just like, uh, <laughs> sorry, if you're from Renishaw, you can make some comments about this. But in the same way that Sir Richard uh, Arkwright got a, got a night shift for, for inventing that, you know, the whole spinning wheel stuff, the, the uh, spinning presses back in 1768, I think that they gave one to, to McMurdy also for the probe that were here, which actually helped automate are probing here and it, it, it lent itself to the automation of inspection in general for the CMM, which again is just one more step in, in the, the path of the Industrial Revolution that we're still walking down. So let's, uh, this is kind of related to probing, I think. Uh, John Harris at, says, so I added a fixture to the bottom of my tool probe for a 96 millimeter fifth axis rock lock. Have, have you guys had any experience with this approach to free up space on the table? Oh, that's awesome. Okay, so. So I get, he's gonna make me break this. Okay, so 
You're gonna automate your setup process. Do you know what the best way to automate your setup process is? How do I automate this? We can automate it by, I can, I can set my work offset with my probe and that automates a setup. Mm -hmm. The best way to automate a setup, he, he, just, he just ruined my entire like premise here. <laughs> blew a hole in like right this. The best way to automate a process is to erase it. You have to realize that, wait a second, you, somebody has to be in the room saying, oh, that's good, we made this faster. And then somebody in the room has to say, should we be doing that at all? And he's talking about a, the, all the different types of fixtures that you can put on a machine. So I make a video on how to make a vice straight and tighten it down. And then the next guy is saying, why are you making a vice straight and putting it down? Why not put pins, right? They've got that, you know, that, you know whatever it is, 90 millimeter, 55 millimeter spacing with the rock lock system, with our own system, zero point systems that have, um, you know, zero points. So they'll, it's like a, looks like a pull stud and then it goes into a receptacle. And so your entire fixture plate will come and lock in. Go onto the Haas website. We've got a ton of tooling that works the same way. A lot of our vices work on it. A lot of stuff that's out there is there. We've got rotaries that we're selling right now. If you look at the, the TRT-160, the 210, we're selling um, zero point fixtures that mount right in there that have pneumatic actuators in there. So to change, to change out from one fixture to the next, you flip a switch and it goes and the whole fixture pops off. And so what have you just done? Did you automate the setup you know, of your, your rotary with that? No, you removed it completely and it doesn't get any faster than that. You didn't have to set it up. All you did was put it in. It, it, the one minute setup, that's what you're looking for. And it's these type of zero point fixtures, um, zero point that it locates the X, the Y and the Z, the Z, all in one operation with one single type of pull stud or a few of them. Um, for the old schools, we used to do this with, uh, with round and diamond pins. So if I was building a fixture and I wanted to control it, I would use a round pin here and that would, that would get me in, in this direction and this direction alignment, but my part could still rotate. And so then what you would do is you'd put in a, a diamond pin on the other side of your fixture here, which would keep your part from rotating. So if you want to save yourself some money right now and you don't have money for a, for a zero point fixture today, go and buy yourself some round and diamond pins, build all your fixtures with that. This guy is going to locate you in the X and the Y. This guy is going to, the diamond pins going to keep you from rotating and you can make your own fixtures that work almost as well as a zero point, except with these type of fixtures, you still have to clamp it down. So you're gonna have to put in a half dozen socket head cap screws uh, to, to hold it down, but still. So, so this is a very inexpensive way to make a two minute fixture. And if you want a one minute fixture with like no setup time, then just buy the zero point system and your entire life changes. So in the, in the 2000s, 1998, something like that, I worked in a golf place. We were doing a lot of uh, high end machining for, for medical automotive and stuff like that. But um, we were also doing tons of golf stuff. The person I worked for, Keith Peterson, great guy. Um, we made these fixtures and his brother, Kevin, they were designing these fixtures that would hold the golf putters for Scotty Cameron, right? Scotty Cameron by Titleist. I did so much stinking engraving. And our fixtures were awesome. You put them on and we had milled flats on the top. So all you had to do to switch from a, from a Newport 2 to a uh, whatever Laguna putter was to bolt in this fixture, boom, a couple socket head cap screws, you'd indicate it flat and then you'd sweep the hole in the top. And that was it, your setup's done, you change the program, it runs. And we thought we were, we were the stuff. And then stupid Danny Ashcraft down the street, right? At his place doing the golf stuff, we went and looked at him and he programmed all of his things off the, 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 the knee that was that we built our fixture to. And then he wrote his offsets into his program. He G10 the work offsets. We'll make a video on G10. G10 right into work offsets. Make video. And so what he was doing is this exact same thing we were, except we had to indicate our, our fixture straight and then pick up the hole. And he put the hole on the knee that was never moved from the machine. And so when he switched from a, a Newport 2 to a Laguna putter, all he did was switch from this from this guy here to click, to get the guy there, boom, click. And if you wanted to, you could press a button, it would come in, probe what fixture it was, it would load the program for you and it would run. So we automated our setup by adding probing and by putting holes and, and, and milling lines in our fixture so we knew where to make it straight and we thought we were good. And that was really good for 1998. But in 2005, that wasn't good enough. He simply removed his fixturing altogether and had it what was essentially what he was doing was creating his own zero point fixturing to remove the setup process altogether. Definitely go to Haas Tooling Dog, I, whatever, I'm not the sales guy, but 
I'll, I'll, I'll send you there all day long. Go to hostooling.com, check out our fixture, and you can see all the zero point things and, and our rotary devices have the, the things that locate. It's, it's incredible. And yeah, best way to automate your setup is by probing. And then I take that back. The best way to automate your setup is to remove the setup entirely. Go so down point. let's do a big old segue here, uh, which I think is appropriate at this point. Talking about work holding, uh, we have another little thing to show off here. Oh. Not little by any means, actually. Um, so I was thinking maybe we'd see a comment or two in here about this red vice we have inside the machine. But uh, so Mark, tell us a little bit about what we have in, in the middle of the table there. So I'm gonna jog this thing forward. Maybe we'll get a better picture of it. So behind me, we've got, um, we've got Haas work holding by, by Kurt. And so what that is, is a, a standard Kurt vice that we've all come to know and love. I, I love Kurt, I've been using them forever. We started out with like, you know, D675s, D6088s, the metric versions and all that stuff. And it's just a good solid vice. And we've made, a, um, if you go back through our earlier videos, you'll see a lot of these Kurt vices showing up in them. And we sell a lot of different brands of vices. Uh, so there's, there's always stuff out there. But um, more recently, they, they they worked with Kurt to come up with the, the Haas brand advice. They're making tooling to our specifications and vice versa uh, to make things work. Now, this right here on the, that's on our machine right now is a DXX vice. It, it came up and, and we were joking about making a video on it because uh, it's got one of the coolest things ever on it. This is a silly little thing, but if you've got a Kurt vice, uh, you've got to check this out and, and realize what's going on here. And I'll show you this real quick. So, so this guy, it, this is a this is a Kurt TXX vice. It's got a larger you know shaft on it. It's got all the clampy torque you need. It's kind of like the old um, was it not wedge lock but angle lock vice. Yeah, it's really easy I to clean. I think it has the same angle lock technology. Yeah, bigger bearing pack. I it's think it's solid. The just, tighter, it's the beautiful design. The tighter I clamp on this sucker, the better it. it the more it draws this this floating jaw down. And we've made videos on milling soft jaws for mills. Uh, so you can take a look at that video and you'll see a bunch of uh, vices in there. But th just one silly thing that I thought was cool that I wanted to show you guys was, was that if I'm loading up a part, I have to put a stop on there. And so we'll always, we'll always, uh, uh, you know, we'll load up a part and put that thing. But there's a little thing here on the front and most people don't even know what this guy is. And uh, oh, are you on this camera? Yeah, gotcha. oh, oh, wow. Okay, so cool. So, so there's a little thing here and this thing right here in the front of your Kurt vise is a, is a stop. Let me pull this off and I'll show you what I'm talking about. If I got the right Allen wrench. Okay, so, so this thing is a part stop right here and I'll put it up here so you can see it better. And there's a socketed cap screw on the underside that, that tightens to get it against it and there's, a, there's an angled wedge there. And as you tighten the set screw, it expands the wedges because they're on an incline and it'll tighten um, you know, horizontally. So what we can do with this little guy, we've got a stop here that works for a lot of our different parts. And I'm going to go ahead and move this guy. I'm going to go ahead and move this stop and we're going to take this guy and put it on our back jaw right now so if you look at this i'm gonna put this guy back here if you, if you caught that let me loosen that a little bit at the same time so see how this guy fits in there this is why these standard jaws that come with the kurt vice are uh are grooved like this is for that stop so if i have a part like this guy and i'm going to be running a few of them i need it to be right in the center i don't want to straddle it i can just put that guy in there i'll slide this over i'll put my arm wrench in tighten that it expands it holds it rock solid uh, that little stop is has got to be forged because it's way too strong for just be um, even billet. So it's a nice little piece. Tighten up my chuck jaw, and in a way we go. So it's kind of fun to have a completely removable stop that is that's already on your vice. So when you buy these when you buy these things and you don't know what this thing is in front, uh, just realize that it's a stop for our parts. So you can check that out. But there's plenty of stuff to talk about with, with the work holding, but um, there's very few things that are as um, universal. And I just, I use them all the time. <laughs> six inch vice and then in people, machining. Yeah, and then go to the hospital. We have a video that's make a vice straight and we show you how to indicate things and how to use an indicator to pick up a hole. And then you can look through the comments uh, of that video and say, what are you doing? Why don't you just uh, dowel your, the bottom of your vice and put a sub fixture on. So when you grab your vice, you just go, click and you set it on the subplate and and um and and if we don't sell them kurt sells and they sell the little keyway stuff and they sell diamonds and stuff also that you can pin these things so you can just grab that vice and go click which again 
uh, I, it only t <laughs> if you've done it the old way for too long, like some of us have, uh, it only takes uh, uh, two minutes. I mean, I can put a vice in and make it straight. But the best way is for your employees is to have it take you know one minute and just put it on pins, drop it on there after you've made it straight that's, once. And that's everyone's resistance. I mean, we all have it. You, you get used to doing something a certain way and, you're, and you are good at it. Um, so it's part of what holds you back from taking the next step in anything. And, and then we say, what's the problem here? It's like, well, it only takes two minutes to do that. And we have to be really careful with that. It takes me two minutes to do that because I've been doing this for 25 years. And, but how long did it take me when I was only doing it for six months? It took me 25 minutes of me beating a vice around back and forth, right, back and forth, right. back and forth, not knowing whatever. And, and it's, a, it's, the, it's not the right way. Sometimes we get really good at doing things the wrong way, but that doesn't mean it's the right way. We should always be focused on automation, uh, just like we talked about, and we need to be jumping into those things right now. We gotta be jumping into the robots, the auto loads, all that kind of stuff, because that's where things are moving. And the younger guys, um, the, the, that started out with their cam system and their, their robots and stuff. Just like my, my, my great grandfather was a machinist and he taught machining in Orange County. Uh, he was amazing. He was amazing. And I would destroy him. If he saw what, if he saw what I could do today, uh, he would be blown away. And in the same way, everyone that's watching our videos, you guys are getting better than us. You're going to be better than us. And that's the point. It's that it's, this is the time that yeah. we are taking. Uh, what, what little we know and we're passing the baton to you because, and we know it, that you're going to be better than we are. Uh, we had high school kids that were doing robotics programs, machining out parts, and, uh, and that was 10 years ago. Now a lot of those kids are better than me at machining. They're using the CAM system like they should. They're doing everything the way they should. And, and they're going to be looking at me saying, I would crush, I would crush Mark. I would crush this. <laughs> and, and, and we don't, and it's, it, it, it burns. It, I will, I will all admit it, it burns a little, <laughs> it stings. But that's the goal, isn't it? We want you guys to be better than, than we are. And we're doing our best to make that happen. So uh, along the lines of fixturing and such, you've certainly, you're someone who's held parts in lots of different ways. Intubin Gamer says... Soft jaws cost money, obviously. What? Plastics are cheaper than aluminum or steel. Would it be possible to 3D print soft jobs for one-off jobs? By the way, like your tool holder video. I think that just segues it. I mean, you, you know, you've certainly held, you know, you, I know you've held, held parts with everything from a huge vices and giant, you know, super strong work holding all the way down to like, you know, double-sided tape and that kind of thing. So yeah, the, 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 I mean, you're kind of, you're, you know, you're, you're, picking your fixturing and work holding based on what your production needs are and yeah yeah have you guys uh, if you pull up my um if you pull up my uh computer feed yep so uh so if you we'll just i don't know why i'm thinking about this this is more of a geek thing than anything but uh uh this video is going nuts online right now so there was an old technology that, and this vice looks like it's about 100 years old but uh this is the this is the meme of the month this video has been out for three weeks it's got 10 million views and it's talking about rare antique fractal vice. Uh, we'll see if it's, it's, there it goes right there. And so you can see this thing going, and this is a fractal vice, and they don't make them anymore. If, you, if, if they make them anymore, you guys can tell us. And so they, this guy's taking this vice, and it'll basically hold any shape you can think of. And uh, it's pretty amazing. He rebuilds it. Let's get to the fun part at the end where he holds some parts. We'll skip ahead, and you're like, "This is this is what he's doing here." So you can see this is a oh, fractal jaw. This has nothing to do with anything. This is <laughs> this is just. Hey, it's all about the segues. Yeah. So look at this thing; it's pretty fun. I love this. Look at this. He's got a jar. So this video is incredible, and it's and it's fun to watch. The problem is, is that um, oh, yeah, don't do that. He broke the glass. But the problem with this is, is that you're not giving it a very precise known. Um, X, Y location with this type of jaw. And right now, 3D printers are not precise enough to give me the, the, the two tenths of um, sweep to get it. Now, if you're holding something like this with a 3D printed jaw and you're registering against the floor to keep your Z level accurate, then that's fantastic. But um, aside from that, we can go back to a roll here. Hey, maybe, maybe you need to probe your part to uh, you could find use position. it. If I was going to use one of these, if I was going to use one of these um, fractal vices, which are which are cool, 
but obviously they're not on every machine shop floor for a reason because if you can't hold the parts straight, it wasn't much good to them. But now with the probing that we just talked about, you can go beep, 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 and even if the part's not straight, you can, you can do, and by the way, that, uh, you can find that video, you can Google rare antique fractal vice, F-R-A-C-T-A-L. But same thing with 3D printed devices. 3D printed devices are not accurate enough for precision work, but if you locate against the floor of the vice, uh, which is a ground surface, and so your Z is right, and you probe the other thing this way, you can still indicate your part. You can break your vise around and move it to make it straight, or you can probe it to make it straight. Sure, there's a lot of fantastic uses for, for those type of 3D printed jaws. Um, you know, we'll use more and more of that in the future. But again, we also made a um, uh, Haas mill soft jaws. Um, you can come back to my computer again real, real quick. Um, take a look at this video. You can see when we Google this, oh look, there's your, your that's funny, Andrew's here and Frank's here and they made this soft job video that's got two million views. Uh, fantastic video if you got a lathe. And this mill one here that we're kind of talking about, Frank did the graphics on this guy too. But um, we go through here and we actually talk a lot about how to mill soft jaws and, um, and how to make your own and why you want to do it a certain way. And so um, we've got some, we got a lot of tricks for you here too. So uh, you can be sure to check that out. And, um, and, and we'll give you a lot of good information about when to use soft jaws, how, what, why. Uh, we sell soft jaws on hostooling.com. Um, and if we don't, we will, because I've, I've used them. I'm using them right now. I've been using them for a long time. And so you can go to hostooling.com. I'm gonna pull that up, hostooling.com. And we've just got all kinds of good stuff here. So millwork holding. Um, there is so much stuff that's happening with hostooling.com. We are adding stuff. Oh, look, so they're up there. So you can buy uh, mill vice jaws here uh, on the website and um, different sizes like that. Um, if, if, if you need jaws right away, uh, we provide that. Um, or you can make your own. Uh, there's just, you know, we got different options for you, but um, you can check that out. So another, another probing comment uh, and question, JJ Sessa says, Hey Mark, we broke a probe tip yesterday and it made me remember how much it sucks to center the spindle probe. The Haas calibration video seems to rush through this process. Do you have any tips? And this is certainly something we've all, I've even, I've even done that. So, okay, so this is at the heart, this is at the heart of why we calibrate in the first place. So when we talk about why we're gonna calibrate something in the first place, and Frank, I might put you on a camera here inside the machine in a minute. Okay. But uh, first off, let's get the whiteboard. And when we're talking about probe calibration, so, so we can go to the whiteboard here in a second. Uh, let me go to calibration cycles, vector measuring cycles. 9801, 9804, I want the 9804 cycle. I'm, I'm, I'm in the Inspection Plus manual right now. I'm going down here and looking for it. I, for a second, you can go to my screen. Yeah, just talk to your laptop. Cool. So what I'm doing here is I'm, I, I've forgotten the macro variables. 9804. Right there. Okay, so, so there's a bunch of numbers here on the screen that you don't care about typically. But when you calibrate a stylus, what it's going to do is it's going to say, what's the diameter of this ruby tip on my thing? And how far out of, out of round is this thing swing? And it'll put these, it'll put all these numbers in um, in the control, and it can compensate for it. So uh, we can go to the whiteboard, and I'll show you this real quick. But um, when when you grab this, you can we have we touch on this in a Haas calibration video. Um, but there are screws here. There are four set screws that come around the outside edge, and we use a tiny little Allen wrench there. And you have to be careful. Sometimes there's a backup set screw here, so you're tightening, you're loosening those, thinking that you're tightening, you're loosening it and wondering why it's not working, it's because you have to take the first set screw out and then you tighten the second set screw in there to actually adjust it. And um, a lot of precision tools are made this way. We had um, valve seat, um, CBN valve seat cutters and we could make those things perfectly you know, on center. It's the same way you buck a chuck on a lathe. By adjusting these four screws, you can get this thing perfect. But if it's not perfect, like when I change out this probe tip, if I change out this probe tip, which is a 50 millimeter probe tip, and if I change out to the 100 millimeter probe tip, um, I guarantee you this sucker's not gonna be the same. These are precise, but they're only precise at the tip, these round edges. And this particular tip is probably six millimeters. But it might not be six millimeters. It might be really close to six millimeters in diameter. 
But when I change out this tip for this tip, or if I break one of these tips and they're, they're throwaways, and uh, man, we should be selling these on uh, hostooling.com. Reminder to self, uh, write that down. Uh, we sell the probes, why don't we sell the tips? Um, you can buy them online, but um, we, should, we should look at selling these uh, ourselves. If you replace that probe tip here, and it's time to uh, make this thing right, you could put this probe in your spindle, calibrate it, and you'd be getting good numbers right away. That's a really awful, awful bad idea. What you should be doing is, and I, I could put this on the machine, but I'll show you this way. What I'll do is I'll take a, uh, an indicator on a mag base. Now this is a half thou indicator. I just, I love this, this is my interrapid indicator. I will load the tool into my spindle and I'll sweep it around and around. You find the high point of the ruby tip, you find the zenith of that, of that ball that way, and then once you find the high point that way, then you stop, and then you find the high point this way. And now you're at the very tippy tippy top of the, of the, the ruby tip. TDC. Uh, TDC, right? <laughs> and then once you're there, then you can reach in by hand and spin this thing, and you can uh, adjust this thing on center. Now, typically I tighten up the top two set screws pretty tight so the thing doesn't fall out. And then I snug these bottom ones, and then I just loosen them back and forth. And it is hard, it takes some time to get used to. Um, once you get good at it, you can do it in, in certainly under five minutes. Um, and so if, it's, if you need to move this thing this way or this way, you just loosen up this screw, tighten the other one, and it's gonna move this thing forward or back. I will rotate it, and as I rotate it against the indicator, I'm only looking at these set screws. I want this set screw facing towards me, and I get that on zero. And then I spin it 180 degrees out, and then that says I'm off by five thou, you could be off by 15 thou. These things are, can be vary quite a bit from, from tip to tip. But if I'm off by 15 thou, so it was zero on this screw, 180 out, I'm at 15 thou. I adjust those screws until I move the seven and a half thou. Then I re-zero my indicator, I'm at zero and I spin it, and now I'm at zero in that direction. And then I rotate it 90 degrees, and I go on that, and that thing says eight thou. And I adjust that until it reads zero. And I just keep going back and forth. Watch our picking up a whole video. It kind of explains how to use an indicator. But the, the, when you're done, you tighten up those set screws, you snug them down, use a second set of set screws to work as backup screws, that's it. But they say that you should be within a certain amount of runout. And um, here's the thing, in general, you don't want any runout. Come on, spend 10 minutes instead of five. You're there with the indicator already. You're there yeah, with the indicator already. Set. Make it read zero. Yeah. And this is why. You want this thing, so the, the values, um, uh, macro variables 556 and 557, tell us what the runout is of this thing, how much wobble it is. And the software, when you probe, it's compensating for that. But you don't want it to, and this is why. Whenever I calibrate a probe, I make sure it's zero, first off. So mechanically it's sound, so it shouldn't need calibration. I want this thing just dead nuts round on center with my indicator. Sorry, my indicator's lying on the, the indicator. <laughs> so I want this thing, uh, to have no run out at all. And at that point, really, you don't even need to calibrate this thing. I mean, it's, it's gonna calibrate for the six millimeter diameter, but it's not gonna have to, to lie to the probe about it being off in the X or Y. Um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good way to do it. But here's the thing. If you put this probe in and like you were cheesy and you're off by half thou, and you put this, pull this probe out, you spin it 180 degrees and you put it back in, not only will it be compensating for that half thou, you just put the probe in backwards, and now it's gonna be compensating half thou in the wrong way, which means your probe is gonna be off by a thou. That's why I hate it when I walk by shops and I see their probes sitting outside their machine. Well, I don't wanna go into the tool changer, I think it's dangerous. Dude, leave your probes in the machine. Not only that, but get in the habit of loving the Haas logo. Go to <laughs> HaasTooling.com. Love the Haas logo. When I load a tool, I always load my probe, and I, when I tighten up these set screws, I, I put it in the spindle, I M19 orientate the spindle so it locks in, and then before I adjust those set screws, I leave them a little bit loose and I rotate the body of my OMP 40-2 probe until that Haas logo is facing me. And so I wanna see it every time. And it's not just because I like the Haas logo and because I work for Haas, but because every time, if I do pull that probe out and I put it back in, let's say I change the batteries, I want to put that probe back in in the same orientation that it was pulled out, otherwise it will goof up my calibration. So again, it shouldn't matter if you did your job and it was perfectly straight, but nothing's perfect. Even if it just saves you a, a couple tenths of a thou, I want my couple tenths of a thou. I don't want to probe the edge of a part and have it be off by, by two tenths of a thou. Or if it was off by two tenths here and I put it in backwards, when I probe my X, it would be off by four tenths of a thou. That's like, 
dude. Yeah. I'm, it's dude, almost half a thousand. Yeah, dude, you can't yeah. do that. So when you, these are the, the things that are important when you're, when you're setting up a probe. So I always do that. And not only that, but the vector calibration cycle, it's going to, um, it's going to, the vector calibration, the vector cycles need the vector calibration, the three-point Boeing, because it's not just compensating with one or two macro variables that could be off radially in this direction and this direction. You might be off in this direction, at, you know, or that, all these different angles. And so the macros are doing all kinds of crazy math to compensate for our inability as machinists to make something on center. So just get, a, get good at indicating your stuff and everything's going to run better. You know, I'd found uh, just something to add to that. I found that Bring, getting setting the run out on the tips when you're when you're adjusting those two set screws <laughs> I, it's very e especially when you're you're looking for a couple thou or something just to get close it's very easy to keep overshooting that so i would always just load whatever whatever your screw you're setting with you're kind of preloading the opposite side and you're kind of oh, yeah. unwinding one as you're adding the other one and that way you're not tending to shoot the thing to one side and shoot the other thing to the other side. You're just trying to, you know, because it's such a small amount of movement. You're leaving movement. it snug, and then as you tighten it, if, when you tighten it- You're almost it, you're, snugging into the opposite set screw. You, you're, as you tighten it, it's gonna move by a thou. So you have to already have the other one, the back, the back screw tight as you tighten the front one. And it just takes, yeah, it takes a feel, but then you do it a few times after you've yeah. rocketed your, uh, my favorite thing, well, I've only done it once, I think, is hit the tool release button and rocket the probe into the table. So the probing new routines that I've got beating, here, um, again, when I, when I program stuff into my machine, I always, I try and send it to G53, Z0, G53, G0, G90, Z0. It's going to come all the way forward before it moves in my X, Y into the probing position. Because if you have that machine here, and you don't move up in the Z first, that's when I, that's when I break probing tips. Because it moves sideways through something that snaps it off. And that's why you always use, if you're programming um, in part inspection, we, we look at Haas probing on YouTube, look at all those videos, especially the one that says one, two, three, four, five. And it, it gives you all the safe startup lines, those 98, 10 moves, protected positioning moves to make sure that we don't break our tips. But that's the beauty of this thing is that these things um, are replaceable, right? You don't want to replace this body. You want to replace just the, the probe tip. And they are pretty simple to, to get in, but get good at calibrating your probes. Um, um, I got an email the other day about that. Somebody lost their macros. Setting 23 locks those macro variables. Um, you can turn that on and off. Um, if you're not having any probe problems right now, great. Go turn off setting 23, get a backup of your machine so you have all those macro variables right now. If you're not having problems right now, that's when you need to get a backup. So, <laughs> so finish this video, go turn setting 23 off, put all the 9,000 programs on an NGC machine. There's a 9,000 folder on a classic cost controller just listed under the main. When you turn setting 23 off, you see them all. Put them all on a USB stick, put them on your computer, and um, say probe macros. So then when someday somebody does turn it off and they wipe out their programs, um, you don't have to call us to get your probe macros again. And we have them listed on the website. You can search for them. I suggest you just um, call up your dealer, get the probe macros, because the probe macros are different based on what type of probe you have. If you've got a wired table probe, they're, they're using the 1.9s. If, if you have a, a, an older wireless system, you're using the version 2.7. If you've got the NGC machine, you've got the newest, whatever, 3 point something version. So if you need those 9,000 programs to run your macros, um, just call your dealer. They'll, they'll hook you up. I just lost it now. Oh, let me find this again. Um, there's a question about man. So I and I apologize because I couldn't I couldn't read the name anyway. Um, there we go. So at my shop I work at, we have a Zoller mesh meshime presetter. I'm assuming nice. um, to give us a tool offset. So my question is, what is more accurate, the table probe or the tool offset mesh meshime? It's, it's weird. You're interfacing two machines. I'm not sure I'd say which one's more accurate. Uh, I'm guessing the Zola's you, probably more accurate. I mean, you really, accurate. in the yeah, end, you'd really only but it know that matter. by by doing some kind of comparison. It's, it's, it's a, here's the thing. It's a meaningless number. This comes back to the same thing we were talking about earlier. Why, uh, like John Nelson made a video on, on, on calibrating your probes. And he sticks a dial pin in there, and he grabs his scale, and he holds it up against there, and says, I'm this far from my spindle. And then he uses that to set his tool offset. And like there, it's, it's, it's hard to explain, but it's, just, it's, a, it's an internal loop. It doesn't matter how accurate it is. Uh, what matters is that you set, the, you set your tool length on your probe with your table probe. 
And then even if the number is not perfectly just some imaginary gauge line that's hanging out in space where this tapers at 1.75 diameter, it's a meaningless number. It's this kind of internal loop. Uh, so for this particular case, it's not a matter of which one's more accurate. It's a, it's a matter of if you're using a tool presetter, just use the same tool to calibrate your, to calibrate your, um, your Zoller that you use to calibrate the, the, the tool presetter on your machine and things are gonna match up perfectly. So that's what you wanna do. So um, I'm not sure which one's you know, uh, more accurate, but it, it, it's, it's, a weird, it's a weird conundrum. <laughs> um, let's see, I'm gonna do, uh, we're gonna wrap it up here. We're, going, we're already all at a well over an hour. Um, there's a ton of questions. Um, we can, yeah, oh yeah, so if you find one, we can. Uh, DTM asks, we are in the process of ordering a VM2 with a TRT-160. Nice. Will I still be able to have two six-inch devices with the TRT-160 on the table without a subplate? Why well, I need a subplate? It's hard to answer, I suppose, without so exactly... I have no, I've got no idea. We uh, Talk to your dealer. They know what the fit... They have a fit chart for all the rotaries. They know what's in there. And they can tell you what the gap is. What the cool thing about the TRT-160 is, though, which is awesome, and the new TRT-210, is that a lot of cost customers used to um, put a subplate on their machines and the subplate, you know, they'd have an inch and a half piece of steel plate and they would make that plate, you know, a foot longer on the right hand side than their table. Then they would mount their TRTs, whatever, off the table to that metal plate. See where I'm going? So that only the platter was inside the X travel of the machine. So you can always cheat and do that. So no matter what your dealer says, get the model of the machine and we give you the models. You can go to, uh, to HaasCNC.com, go to the, your VM2 page, download the model, you can download there. You can have fun in your, in your CAM system, CAD system, uh, putting things together. And if all you need is the, the rotary platter inside your travel limits, so you can put your rotary off the table. And I mention that uh, because um, our rotary department's aware of that. That's why when they designed the TRT-160 and the 210, if you look at this, it's got a really cool, it's got a really cool uh, I don't know, flare at the back of the rotary. That thing's meant to be hanging off the side of your table. You know, so you slide that thing all the way to the right where only the metal is touching the table, the metal. And so they, they, the redesigned TRTs are giving you more travel than you think you have. And so uh, model it up, see what you got. And if you still want more, you can probably put a subplate on there, stretch it out just a you know, few inches past the edge of the table where your work envelope is there. There's yeah, lots of things to budget. It's certainly on, uh, yeah, it seems like that should fit. I think it'll um, fit, but yeah. I don't know. I'd have to, I, I can't say. And you can talk to your, um, and, you talk and to the sales. measurements for the, for the, for the TRT are online. So you could, you could take yeah. your three measurements and plop them right there yeah. on the, on the table size for that machine. And it, you can, you should be able to tell right there, yeah. I think. And again, that, that rotary is built for hanging off the table, uh, to give you every, every inch every you last can inch of, of travel, extra travel. Right. So I think we'll wrap it up here in a second, but this is kind of a fun one. Zachary Schumacher says, I've noticed that growing a beard has given me much better surface finishes. It does. Am I superstitious or is there a, some other phenomena causing this? Ha ha, ha anyway, great job. If you start machining, right? So if you got that- That's why I'm growing a beard because I'm, I'm thinking about becoming a real machinist, I guess. <laughs> It's, it, it's, it, it, it's age. The older you get, <laughs> the older you get, the, the better you think you are. And so is that what it is? It's just, it's just age and experience increasing and also the tendency to grow a beard as you get older? Yeah, I think that's, yeah, that's it. I, I would say that your surface finish does increase with your beard. <laughs> yeah. So does that mean the guys with the hugest beards have the best surface finishes? It does. They are the best surface finishes, but they're terrible lathe guys. <laughs> and we'll let you, ma they're terrible manual lathe guys, and we'll let you figure that out. You don't want long beards with manual lathes. So I think that'll do it for us today. We've, this is a really long one. Thank you so much for joining us. A ton of people online uh, joining us today from all over. Thank you so much. Uh, again, there's a ton of stuff that we didn't get a chance to, to answer. We'll certainly most Emails. likely throw some of these onto the next live TOD. But in the meantime, please, uh, uh, we'll have these questions here. But if you if you don't get it answered, post it on this video after it's um, yeah. after it's, it goes up and we'll do our best to answer the questions there. We'll also link, can we, can we put links in the description for live videos? Oh yeah, definitely. So Absolutely. we will, so I, I know, we will link to the video bonus content that we keep talking about that we didn't show you. Um, we'll link, you can Google it, but we'll also put links in the description to this video after it's posted to a bunch of these different videos with like descriptions of, you know, we'll, we'll yeah, give us a day or two and we'll add links to all the stuff that we referenced uh, right in the description. And that is it. We will see you guys at our next live TOD. Thanks so much, guys.